Good morning. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Dr. Carol Zimbalati, and I'm a public health physician at the health unit. I'm filling in for Dr. Chirico while he is taking some well-deserved time off. Today, I am, in, I am joined by Louise Gagne, Executive Director of Community Services, to provide an update on the local COVID-19 situation, as well as Andrea McClellan, Director of the COVID-19 Immunization Strategy, who will speak about the COVID-19 vaccination rollout. Last week, Ontario announced its roadmap to reopen, outlining how the province will start to reopen over the summer months. In addition to the roadmap, the province is now allowing outdoor gatherings of up to five people while physically distancing from people that you do not live with and the opening of outdoor amenities such as golf courses and tennis courts. We need to remember that we are still in a stay at home order until June 2nd. The province wide emergency break restrictions remain in effect until the province moves into step one of the roadmap, which is expected to take place mid June. We know that the number of people who have at least their first dose of COVID-19 is one of the indicators to reopening, but the province will be looking at other key indicators as well, low case numbers being one of them. We need to continue to follow public health measures to help ensure that we are able to work through the provincial roadmap and safely reopen Ontario. Provincially, there has been a steady decrease in COVID-19 cases. However, in our district, we have had more cases of COVID-19 in the month of May compared to any other month since the beginning of the pandemic. Until we are able to get more people vaccinated, we must all follow public health measures to keep provincial numbers low and lower our local numbers. With that, I'd like to hand it now over to Ms. Gagne to provide an update on our local COVID-19 situation. Thank you, Dr. Zimbalati. In the last seven days, we have had 12 new cases, bringing our total case count to 444, with 278 in the Nipissing District and 166 in the District of Perry Sound. The most common exposure of cases over the last seven days is being a close contact of a case. In terms of active cases, the health unit currently has 30. Eight or 27% of our active cases are linked to outbreaks, and all eight of these are linked to outbreaks outside of our district. We currently have one active case in a childcare setting. With respect to schools, we have not yet received official direction from the province as to whether there will be a return to in-person learning in June. We recognize the positive impact that a return to in-person learning will have for our children and youth, and as well for parents and guardians who have been doing their best to balance online learning with work and home life. As you may have seen from Dr. David Williams's communication earlier this week, medical officers of health throughout the province, including Dr. Cherico and SickKids, are advocating for the return to in-person learning and specifically for it to occur before the province starts to reopen. We hope to hear official direction from, from the province on the situation soon. With summer approaching, the health unit has understandably been receiving inquiries relating to the status of campgrounds and trailer parks. At this stage with the current order, campsites in seasonal campgrounds are available only for trailers and recreational vehicles that are used by individuals either who are in need of housing or who are permitted to be there by the terms of a full season contract. Once we are in step one, of the province's roadmap to reopen. Campsites, campgrounds, and short-term rentals will be allowed, including overnight camping at Ontario Parks. With that, I'll pass it back to Dr. Zimbalati. Thank you, Ms. Gagne. Now to Ms. McClellan, who will provide an update on our vaccine rollout this week. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Zimbalati. 
I'm happy to say that 61% of adults 18 years of age and older living in our district have received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. As of yesterday at 3 p.m., we have provided 67,270 vaccinations in our district. Individuals 12 to 17 years of age are now eligible to receive the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccination. These individuals are eligible to book an appointment at one of our vaccination clinics. At this time, the Pfizer Bio, BioNTech vaccine is the only approved vaccine for children 12 to 17 years of age by Health Canada. The weeks of June 14th and June 21st, youth focused clinics will be offered across the district. Only individuals 12 to 17 years of age will be eligible to book into these clinics. Youth must have turned 12 on the day they are immunized to be eligible to receive the vaccine. Clinics will be listed on the provincial booking system and appointments will be available to be booked either online or through the call center. Individuals 18 years of age and older who are booking their COVID-19 vaccination appointment are encouraged to take the first vaccine available to them. The health unit is unable to confirm the product to be used for any clinic as the decision is based on the vaccine availability at the time of the clinic. The COVID-19 vaccination rollout means we are one step closer to returning to regular day-to-day -day activities. However, we understand some individuals may be a little unsure about getting the COVID vaccine. In an effort to normalize the vaccine within our district, the health unit is launching its One Step Closer campaign. We have turned to everyday people, business owners, managers, staff, parents, grandparents, etc., to share, to help share their story about what getting the COVID-19 vaccination is bringing them one step closer to getting back to normal. Watch for the ads and posts on our social media accounts across YouTube and out in the community. As always, we encourage everyone who can do so to book their vaccine appointment through the provincial booking system. If you require assistance, please call the provincial booking, the provincial phone booking line. Our COVID-19 call center is also available to those with questions at 1-844-478-1400. Now back to you, Dr. Zimbalotti. Thank you, Ms. McClellan. That's it for our prepared remarks. Now we'd like to begin answering your questions. If you have questions, please type them in the Q&A at the top of your screen. Our moderator will, lead, will read them aloud and we will try to cover as many as we can. When possible, please ensure your name is attached to the question. Catherine, please read out the first question. Um, we currently don't have any questions, um, so I will invite any media to submit questions through the Q&A on, um, on this event. Um, you can submit these questions um, for any of our panelists. Our first question um, would be for Andrea. Are there any more specifics on the One Step Closer campaign? It comes from Richard from Moose FM. You're on mute, Andrea. My apologies. Um, I, I don't have any specific details um, about the exact launch date or uh, plans of the launch at this point in time, but we can certainly get back to more to you with more information on that, uh, Richard. Thank you, Andrea. Our next question comes from Jennifer Hamilton McCharles from The Nugget and is for Andrea. Are parents allowed or required to attend the Mass Vaccination Centre in Memorial Gardens along with their children 12 to 17? Parents are absolutely allowed to um, join their child to uh, or accompany their child to attend our clinics at Memorial Gardens uh, for children, uh, but they are not required to be there with the child if they uh, choose not to be. Thank you. 
Our next question comes from Stu from Bay Today and is for Dr. Zimbalati. Did the outbreak cases known uh, know they were positive before entering the district? Um, thank you, Stu, for that question. I'm not sure about uh, the exact uh, time that they became aware of it. I believe that quite a number of them were not tested prior to um, leaving um, and prior to entering our district. Thank you. Our next question um, is for Dr. Zimbalati and it's from Clark from your TV Kojiko News. Uh, can details be provided, provided concerning the transfer of COVID-19 positive patients from Manitoba? Uh, thank you, Clark. Uh, we are in regular contact with the hospitals in our district so that we maintain an awareness of what is happening in terms of uh, the movement of COVID-19 patients and admissions. However, any questions related to patient transfers and admissions are really uh, best answered by the hospitals. So I would redirect your question there, please. Thank you. Our next question is for Louise from Stu from Bay Today. Any updates on the stewards decorating situation? Thanks, Stu. Uh, as you be, would be aware, um, last Friday, uh, the 21st, the Superior Court order was issued by the Superior Court of Justice, restraining Ms. Stewart, the owner and operator of Stewart's decorating from further non-compliance with the Section 22 order that we issued her on April 17th. The health unit uh, applied for that, um, applied to the Superior Court of Justice after investigations conducted by our public health inspectors indicated that Ms. Stewart had not complied with the previously issued Section 22. And the restraining order directs uh, Ms. Stewart to operate as curbside only, as, was, as stipulated in the stay at home order and the reopening Ontario Act. And uh, Ms. Stewart appeared at, uh, at a hearing on Tuesday represented by her counsel. Uh, our return date of June 10th was granted to Ms. Stewart so that she may have an opportunity to make submissions concerning uh, the Superior Court order. And the restraining order that was issued by the Superior Court remains in effect until it is deemed, until it is um, discussed further. Thank you. Our next question is for Andrea from Jennifer at the Nugget. What is the health unit's goal in terms of number of people in the district to be vaccinated? Um, overall, our, we're hoping for um, between 70 and 80 percent of the population um, to be immunized. But choosing to be immunized is an individual decision. Um, what the health unit can do is provide information to individuals to assist them in making um, an informed decision as to whether they choose to be immunized or not. We encourage everybody who is eligible and um, able to, to uh, receive their immunization. Thank you. Our next question would be for Louise from Mo at My Perry Sound Now. When it comes to schools, can you provide more insight into why the health unit is confident in responding to any spikes in cases after reopening them? Thanks for that question. So in terms of uh, reopening, uh, we do know that it's in the, the best interest of our of our children and youth uh, to return to in-person learning uh, for many factors, for many reasons. Uh, in terms of um, feeling uh, safe, uh, we are seeing a very small proportion of our cases resulting from community spread. Most of our cases are associated with uh, outbreaks and close contacts of cases. Uh, in addition, um, the experience that we have had uh, throughout this pandemic has been with our schools has been uh, very positive. Uh, we have not had any outbreaks uh, within our schools. The schools are very compliant with following screening uh, requirements, PPE requirements. We have all the precautions in place within our schools. In addition, um, we have responded quickly 
when there have has been a case within a school dismissing appropriate cohorts and in some cases when there was a linkage to a variant of concern we dismissed an entire school cohort so based on these experiences, we feel confident that schools can reopen safely uh, when they're allowed to do so by the province. Thank you. And um, the next question from Jamie at CTV News um, follows up with this. So um, Louise, you did mention getting students back into the classroom and back to school. Why is it important that this happens? School, uh, being around your peers, being able to attend in-person learning has been shown to be most beneficial for children and youth in terms of their academic uh, performance, their emotional, social and physical well-being. And it's really also provides for some of our children in our community a, a safe place to be able to learn and receive the support that they require. And for this reason, it is important that our children return to school as soon as it's safe to do so. Thank you. Our next question is from Richard and Musa Fem and is for Andrea. How is the standby list process for vaccination working? Is it helping more people get vaccinated sooner? Yes, the, that standby list is working very, very well. Um, people submit their names onto the list on a daily basis wherever clinics are being held. And at the end of the clinics, um, they are called if there are additional doses to uh, uh, available to be uh, utilized. So it um, has the benefit of, of getting a few extra people in for an immunization, and it has a benefit of us not wasting any vaccine at all. Thank you. Another question for Andrea from Jennifer at the Nugget. Why are parents being asked to call the day their child is scheduled to be vaccinated at the Mass Immunization Centre to ensure Pfizer is available? Uh, great question, Jennifer. Um, we're directing parents for with uh, 12 to 17 year olds who have appointments at our mass immunization clinics to give us a call the morning of to confirm that we have Pfizer available at that clinic for them. Um, the only vaccine that children 12 to 17 are able to receive um, is the Pfizer vaccine. Moderna is not approved by Health Canada for 12 to 17 year olds and we are not able to um, necessarily pre-plan um, which vaccine will be available at a clinic. We do to the best of our abilities, but when we have um, challenges from a supply point of view, we may need to change vaccine products for that clinic in order to be able to move forward with that clinic. And so just to prevent a parent from arriving with a child um, and being unable to receive that immunization, uh, we encourage them to call ahead and confirm that we have Pfizer available for them. Thank you. And uh, we've received a question from Stu at Bay today um, on the same uh, topic of 12 to 17 uh, years of age. Can age groups 12 to 17 receive vaccination in clinics for all ages? Thanks, Stu. Yes, they can. Absolutely. If there are appointments available, they're um, able to book into those clinics. We are in the process um, in collaboration with our school boards um, and some of our other community partners uh, planning dedicated youth clinics that only 12 to 17 year olds will attend the weeks of June the 14th and June the 21st across our district. That schedule should be ready uh, shortly and those clinics will be posted and accessible for parents to book their uh, 12 to 17 year olds into. Another question for Andrea from Jennifer at the Nugget. What are the reasons of why people aren't getting vaccinated? I can't speculate on why people choose not to be immunized. Um, it may be a lack of information. It may be a lack of confidence um, in immunizations overall. Um, it may just be a personal choice that they are making at this time and, and waiting to receive further information. Um, we're doing what we can by providing as much information to the public as we can. Our website holds a, a wealth of information. The Ontario.ca website has a lot of information about the vaccine, as does Public Health Ontario. So there are some great resources out there for those who are hesitant, and hopefully um, that will help people to make uh, their decision uh, with respect to vaccines. I just wanted to add to that, you know, some people, they, they need... Um, 
a familiar uh, healthcare provider to to really reassure them that uh, the vaccine is right for them. And so we are um, gradually onboarding more and more primary care offices uh, to be able to facilitate that process. And definitely primary care offices have um, access to the information to be able to counsel their um, patients in the meantime as to whether um, the vaccine is right for them. And for the majority of people, it would be right for them from a health standpoint. So uh, we do encourage you, if you have any questions, to, to reach out either to your trusted healthcare provider or to the health unit or to any of the other resources on our website. Thank you. The next question is for Dr. Zimbalati, and it comes from Richard and Musa Fem. Is there any update on COVID patients from outside the district that are being treated at the North Bay Regional Health Centre? Thank you, Richard. Uh, we are aware of patients being transferred from out of province to help um, uh, facilitate the, the crunch that other provinces provinces are experiencing in terms of acute care. However, any information regarding and decision making around uh, patient transfers is really um, done uh, by the hospitals. And so I would uh, encourage you if you have questions particular to that to reach out to the hospitals for those for that information. Our next question is also for Dr. Zimbalati from Mo and My Paris Sound Now. Can you please provide details on the age demographics of those hospitalized with COVID-19 from Paris Sound? I'm sorry, I don't have the particulars on that available to me uh, right now, so we would have to get back to you with the information that we are able to provide on those cases. Thank you. Our next question is for Louise and it comes from Pauline. Um, she says, um, in terms of seasonal campsites, uh, self-contained um, in her, no her own, um, and currently with the stay-at-home order, she wants to know if she's uh, able to stay longer than 23 hours or must stay for 14 days. Um, or if she is able to come and go as she pleases. So um, just more information around camp campsites, uh, currently what is uh, permitted. Yeah, thanks for that question, Pauline. So right now you need to continue uh, because we are still in the stay at home order. You need to keep following uh, those regulations. Once we're officially into uh, step one of the, of the reopen plan, um, you will be able to uh, resume uh, staying at your at your site uh, permanently or as frequently as you wish. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Andrea. It comes from it comes from Clark at Kojiko News Your TV. With more vaccines being rolled out every day, with some receiving second doses, should case counts continue to be considered uh, when making lockdown decisions? And I apologize. This would be more of a Dr. Zimbalati question. Um, as we mentioned, I think the province is looking at multiple key indicators to. Um, uh, judge when it is safe to move to a next step in the plan. So um, the vaccination rates are certainly one of those key indicators, but case counts are an, another indicator and there um, would be other indicators as well, such as uh, uh, healthcare capacity and uh, any concerns around uh, differing trends. So. Um, I don't think it's just, uh, it's not certainly a one indicator that they are looking at. Thank you. Our next question is from Jennifer from The Nugget and it's for Andrea. Can residents expect to receive their second dose earlier than expected? Thanks, Jennifer. Um, that's going to be completely dependent on vaccine supply. The priority remains um, to get as many first doses into individuals who wish to have the vaccine as possible as a priority, um, and then second doses uh, as av available. We work within the parameters of the vaccine that we have available, and so the groups who are eligible at this point in time are certainly eligible to book 
their appointments uh, within the um, uh, booking system for shortened intervals. There are a few challenges with the booking system that are being worked on and, and should be resolved in the next couple of days, which will then allow people more people to book into the um, into second dose appointments. But we'll, we continue to focus and, and really promote the first dose initially and second doses we work within the allocation we have available for that. Thank you. Our next question is for, sorry, is for Louise from Mo at My Perry Sound now. Can you provide details on testing in the district of Perry Sound? It seems numbers have been low in the past 10 days. Hi, Mo. I don't have specifics uh, related to the testing numbers for Perry Sound. I know overall we have seen a reduction in uh, testing uh, counts overall, uh, but we can provide the specifics back, look into that and provide specifics back to you. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Our next question uh, information is available on our dashboard if you uh, would care to look at that. And uh, if your question was related more to motivations behind the D or reasons behind the, if there is a decrease in testing in Prairie Sound, um, you know, there, I think that's probably multiple factors and we would only be speculating. Thank you. Our next question is from Jennifer at the Nugget for Dr. Zimbalati. What is the health unit stance in terms of the province's three-stage approach to reopening? If numbers continue to improve, would the health unit be in support of seeing phase one beginning earlier than the stated June 14th reopening? So I think the priority from uh, the health units perspective is getting schools reopened and that would really, of course, we will follow provincial guidance on that, but that is what we are really advocating for. So um, if uh, the indicators are good, then we would like to see schools reopen prior to other sectors potentially. And uh, we do uh, encourage and support the province in the um, slow approach that they are taking to the reopening. So um, we would not uh, encourage um, a more hasty response than the indicators would uh, suggest that we should follow. Thank you. Our next question is from and is for Andrea from Jamie at CTV News. Are you anticipating a shortage of Pfizer vaccines when the 12 to 17 year olds have appointments booked in the upcoming weeks? Thanks for that question, Jamie. No, I don't anticipate a shortage um, of Pfizer vaccine for that. We have um, allocated specific uh, a specific amount of our vaccine to accommodate um, the priority group of the 12 to 17 year olds. And so um, those clinics will be the priority to provide Pfizer to, and then Pfizer vaccine as available for um, everybody else will be, uh, will be allocated. Thank you. And this will be our last question. The question comes from Stu from Bay Today and is for Andrea. Second dose wait times have been shortened for various groups. What will their wait between end up being? What about for general public? Again, that is 100% dependent on vaccine supply. Um, I can't really predict what that's going to look like. We still have a, a significant number of people wanting a first dose, um, as well as a large number of people uh, wishing to or eligible to receive their second dose as well. Uh, priority remains getting first doses into um, individuals and second doses is also a priority um, as vaccine supply is available. Thank you. This marks the end of our press conference. Thank you everyone for joining. A reminder that the recording will be available on our website at a later time today and uh, we will see you next week.